<laughs> Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Tomb Raiders and Terrorist Financing, Cutting Off the Illicit Traffic in Blood Antiquities. My name is Sarah Spelt, and I'm an Assistant Director in the BU Alumni Relations Office. Today's webinar is sponsored by the Boston University Alumni Association and is offered as part of our Live to Learn Alumni Education Program. Many of our educational programs are held on campus, but we are now offering educational webinars because we want to connect with our alumni around the globe. And today's topic has drawn registrants from more than 10 different states, including California, New Jersey, New York, and of course, Massachusetts. For all of you out there, please know we are thrilled to have you all together for this online program. Before I introduce today's speaker, a few housekeeping notes. As you know by now, this webinar is being hosted on the Adobe Connect online meeting platform. If you experience any trouble with the audio or visual portions of this presentation, please contact Adobe Connect at 1-800-422-3623. Today's presentation is being recorded and will soon be available for on-demand viewing on the BU Alumni Association website. Our speaker today is eager to answer your questions, and you are welcome to submit them through the presentation, throughout the presentation, using the Q&A chat box you see located below the slide. We hope to get to as many questions as we can. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Presenting from New Orleans is CIS archaeology alumna Tess Davis. Tess Davis is a lawyer and archaeologist by training. She is executive director of the Antiquities Coalition. She oversees the organization's work to fight cultural racketeering worldwide and also manages the day-to-day -day operations of the Institute staff in Washington. She has been a legal consultant for the Cambodian and U.S. governments and works with both the art world and law enforcement to keep looted antiquities off the market. She writes and speaks widely on these issues, having been published in CNN, Foreign Policy, The Los Angeles Times, The New York Times, The Cambodia Daily, and various scholarly publications and featured in documentaries in America and Europe. In 2015, the royal government of Cambodia knighted Davis for her work to recover the country's plundered treasures, and she is admitted to the New York State Bar. Tess, thank you so much for being with us today. The floor is yours. If you'll give me a couple minutes or a couple seconds, I will pull up your slide. No, oh, fantastic. Th thank you so much. Is everyone able to hear me all right? Um, I, I can hear you. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, again, thank you so much for the invitation um, to speak today. It's, it's such a pleasure um, as a loyal terrier to participate in this program. Um, and again, I do look forward to, to sharing, um, sharing this information with you and answering your questions afterwards. It's a, a topic that's very uh, near and dear to my heart and increasingly important. Um, I think all of us, given the implications, which we'll discuss later. Um, so, so just to jump in and begin, um, with both Iraq and Syria on the brink of collapse to, to jihadists who are too fanatical even for Al-Qaeda, um, the world is rightfully asked how this ragtag militant faction quickly transformed itself into what experts have been frequently calling the world's richest terror group ever. And, the, the so-called Islamic State, which of course is also known as ISIS, also known as ISIL, and also known as Daesh, which is the term I'll be using today, um, has boasted an annual budget worth $2 billion and a war chest of $250 million. And that surpasses by far the Taliban um, and also that of many states. Still more troubling even than those numbers is the fact that Daesh became, quickly became financially self-sufficient and was never dependent on foreign donors and these outside means of cash um, in comparison with, with other terrorist groups that we've dealt with in the past. Um, and of course, this poses the question, how? Um, and the answer to that is extortion, ransom, robbery, and smuggling, indeed, Analysts over time have increasingly characterized Daesh as more of a mafia state than traditional terrorist, and I'm sure it came as no shock to anyone that they had been trafficking arms and even oil. However, the public did react with surprise to reports back in June 2014 um, that Daesh had earned, quote, millions by looting the region's archaeological sites and then selling its ancient treasures to the highest bidder. 
Um, it shouldn't have. The archaeologists, criminologists, law enforcement agents, and military officials have long warned that the illicit antiquities trade is funding crime and conflict around the world. Um, however, under Dash's black flag, this looting and trafficking has become not just a side enterprise, um, but an entire illegal industry. Today, so I'll be speaking about this threat, which is a threat to our world heritage, uh, but also, of course, our global security, and and explore how we can we can combat it. Um, so just to jump in right away, I. I've, as executive director of the Antiquities Coalition, a nonprofit based in Washington, I've been very honored to have a front row seat uh, to these efforts to combat the illicit trade of these bloody antiquities from Iraq and Syria. Our nonprofit uh, unites a diverse group of experts in the fight against the looting and trafficking of antiquities, and particularly that by organized criminals and terrorist organizations. Now, of course, um, as long as there have been tombs, there have been tomb raiders, and I'm sure um, if anyone of you out listening studied archaeology at BU, um, you learned that quite well. Um, and also that as long as there have been civilizations, there have been enemy armies bent on plundering them. But in the modern world, this destruction is taking place on a scale that has never been seen before in history driven by this multi-billion dollar demand for art and antiquities. Now, Dash are not the only bad guys to profit from this by purchasing an Egyptian sarcophagus, a Cambodian statue, or a Mayan vase on Madison Avenue. Collectors may well be unintentionally putting money into the pockets of mafia syndicates and armed insurgents um, and drug cartels. Indeed, like, like so many crimes, the illicit antiquities trade feeds on these times of economic, political, and secu security crisis. And we created the Antiquities Coalition to help empower communities and countries in such times of crisis. Countries today, uh, like Iraq and Syria, we are working with groups um, in both as well as with the Iraqi government. Now, I, I need to stress now that although trained as an archaeologist at Boston University, which is still home to the country's only independent department of archaeology, I am I'm not a near or mis Middle Eastern specialist. I'm a lawyer. I've worked as a legal consultant for Babylon's World Heritage nomination, and I've studied and published on Iraq's preservation law as well as its constitutional law. But for the last decade, um, since my studies at BU, actually, my work has mostly focused on on studying and combating the illicit trade in antiquities itself. And to this end, I've worked with nonprofits, with universities, law enforcement, and governments, and, and actually even, even members, the more responsible members in the art market. And, and I can tell you that this tragedy that's happening to Iraq and Syria now, um, unfortunately, it's happened before. And I know this firsthand because since 2004, I've worked and often lived in the small Southeast Asian nation of Cambodia. Um, I wanted to briefly begin today by sharing some of Cambodia's story with you because it, it very closely parallels what we're seeing today in Iraq and Syria. And this history provides us with valuable lessons uh, for how the international community should respond to today's crisis, but also a very stark warning of what will happen if we don't act. Um, for as many of you will remember just a generation ago, the global hotspot was not Mesopotamia, it was Indochina, Vietnam, Laos, and indeed Cambodia. In Cambodia, which is internationally celebrated for its 12th century temple of Angkor Wat, um, I'm sure some of you today on the webinar have had the, the pleasure of visiting that, but in Cambodia, fighting erupted between government forces and the communist Khmer Rouge in 1970. Decades of civil war, of genocide, of foreign occupation would follow this outbreak, and it ended only with the 1998 death of Pol Pot and the subsequent surrender of his remaining forces. Um, by, by the end of the killing fields, a full quarter of the population had been lost to starvation, to this disease, and an outright murder. Um, as we're seeing today, Throughout the Arab Spring, uh, the Cambodian Civil War triggered 
organized antiquities looting and trafficking, which in turn helped to further bankroll the violence. And few of the country's temples, not even the famous Angkor Wat, were spared from these war profiteers. Um, even more tragically, this cultural racketeering, as we call it, went hand in hand with what is increasingly being called cultural cleansing, and that is the deliberate and systematic destruction of a targeted group and their cultural heritage. And as we've witnessed throughout the 20th century, cultural cleansing aims to eliminate not only a people, but all evidence of them. Um, and in Cambodia, the losses from this cultural cleansing were high. 130 Chan mosques were destroyed. Um, all 73 Catholic churches, including the Phnom Penh Cathedral, uh, were taken apart stone by stone. And a shocking 3,369 contemporary temples, uh, along with sacred literature, statues, etc. And again, this went hand in hand um, with the murder of those populations who worshipped there. While this organized looting and destruction began some 40 years ago, Cambodia is just to now beginning to recover what it's lost. And this chapter of Cambodia's story, this more positive chapter, began just over four years ago. In February 2012, New York Times' front page ran a small headline that would end up leading to big litigation. And that was, um, as you probably have a difficult time reading here, but um, mythical, mythic warriors captive in global art conflict. And in the article, investigative reporters, um, including Tom Mashford, who also occasionally teaches at um, the UN Communications Department, they, they exposed that a major auction house in Manhattan was attempting to sell a thousand-year-old Khmer masterpiece, uh, despite evidence that thieves had hacked it off at the ankles and trafficked it overseas. Uh, this newspaper illustrated this front page story with a photograph of the larger than white mythic warrior as it appeared in the glossy pages of Sotheby's sales catalog. Um, and then another image showed its feet and pedestal, half a world away and still in situ at the 10th century ruins of Koh Kher, uh, deep in the Cambodian jungle. I was identified um, in the article as the scholar who dug out the law. Um, that's what was the words they used, uh, I think, playing a pun on my archaeology studies at BU and certainly prompting a chuckle uh, from my archaeology professors there, uh, who had, of course, remembered a time when I wanted to make my name for a different type of decking. But um, my Cambodian colleagues and I hoped, and I would say even expected, that this publicity, um, New York Times, CNN, um, all sorts of things, would, would ensure the warrior's return. Um, it was just such huge, bad press. And, Journalist Ralph Blumenthal and Boston, uh, Boston's Tom Mashberg had done their homework, presenting much convincing, albeit then still circumstantial, evidence that the statue had been stolen during the early war years. Um, and now that it was branded a, a blood antiquity, why would any reputable collector want to buy it? And even if one did, why would any reputable auction house want to profit from the sale? But um, instead of caving to the publicity, some of which you see here, uh, the auction house doubled down instead, telling the New York Times that the warrior could, quote, have been removed any time in its thousand-year history, and moreover noting that the term stolen was often, quote, used loosely. The, um, the U.S. government disagreed, and on April 4, 2012, they filed a civil forfeiture suit seeking to recover and repatriate the statue to Cambodia. Uh, for the lawyers of you out there, this was an in-rem action, meaning that it was brought against the property itself, uh, which resulted in a rather whimsical case name of U.S. versus 10th century Cambodian sandstone sculpture. And there, if you do this type of law, there are a lot of interesting case names like that. Uh, my favorite being U.S. versus Mongolian dinosaur. Um, that we covered some dinosaur and bones that were, had ended up in the United States. But back to this, bolstered by a series of insider emails. Um, word of the day, I'm sure. U.S. versus Cambodian sculpture revealed that the auction house had been warned. Uh, this statue was, quote, definitely stolen by 
the very scholar they hired uh, to do the write-up and the sales catalog. And this expert, to her credit, urged the owners to offer it back to the National Museum of Cambodia as a gesture of goodwill in order to save everyone some embarrassment. Those were her exact words. And perhaps now the auction house wishes it had listened. Uh, but this wasn't all. Evidence soon came to light um, due to hard work by um, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE agents, that the statue had been looted in 1972, which was smack in the middle of the country's bloody civil war with the Khmer Rouge um, in the chaos leading up to the killing fields themselves. And Again, in this chaos, these paramilitary groups had trafficked it as parts. They broke it apart and shipped it as parts uh, to Thailand. And from there, it was smuggled um, on, on to Europe, where a premier London gallery sold it to none other than Belgian royalty in 1975. Um, the New York Times, uh, after these revelations, the New York Times and Los Angeles Times, uh, then identified another five pieces that had been looted from the same sanctuary at the same temple, perhaps at the same time by the same people, and all were nonetheless on display in prominent American museums. None, none in Boston, but there were some in New York, um, in Cleveland, in Denver, in Los Angeles, so from one end of the country to another and in between. Um, and in doing, Cambodia quickly called for the repatriation of these pieces as well. And in doing so, it launched an international, and I should say still ongoing, effort to bring home um, the, the plundered past of, of the Khmer people. Over the last these last years, uh, Cambodia has very triumphantly played David uh, to the art market's Goliath, joining a host of nations uh, who are fighting to recover their looted and stolen art both through public appeals and also through legal actions. And it's had much success um, recovering the stolen warrior a couple of years ago after two years of litigation and a number of pieces since then. See here, uh, um, at this time of writing, these are the other pieces that have been publicly returned, uh, both from other major auction houses and major US museums. And with the exception of the warrior, all of these were returned voluntarily without any involvement from the court. But each year new research to con continues to identify uh, more looted statues from Cambodia and from elsewhere that are nonetheless in public and private collections around the world. And the government of Cambodia has made their recovery a priority with His Excellency Sakon, who's the Deputy Prime Minister, and uh, Secretary of State Chan Pony himself taking a very active role in these negotiations. Um, but these returns, which were major celebrations, as you see here, are, are still the exception, not the rule. These pieces are just a handful of thousands, if not tens of thousands of pieces that were pillaged during the conflict and its aftermath, and most will never return home. Um, worse, as the case of the warrior shows, looted pieces are still surfacing and they're still being trafficked, bought and sold by the world's top institutions. I want policy uh, towards this illicit trafficking and destruction, uh, which in many ways remains unchanged since Phnom Penh fell to the Khmer Rouge in 1975, has failed Cambodia and it's failing Iraq and Syria today. In the headlines, we're seeing Cambodia's tragedy being repeated in the cradle of civilization as Daesh wages an unrelenting assault on the people of the region and the hair heritage. And like under the Khmer Rouge, under Daesh's black flag, culture has become a, a weapon of war and a terrorist financing tool. And it's for this reason that the, the fight to protect the people of Iraq and Syria and their heritage is increasingly one and the same. Um, of course, as you know, the Middle East is the birthplace of the world's earliest civilizations and cities, the invention of writing and government, and, and the very first recorded laws. But since the 2011 Arab Spring and the start of the Syrian civil war, which spilled over to northern Iraq in 2014, the, regime has, the region has been plagued by crisis and conflict. Um, and the situation is now the worst humanitarian crisis since World War II. Even the most 
detailed statistics on the casualties, the, the millions of lives lost or injured or displaced, numbers which unfortunately go up every day, the homes and cities leveled, um, of course, fail to reveal the full extent of this tragedy. The human toll is, is truly beyond measure and, again, getting worse um, every day. It will likewise never be possible to calculate the cultural toll. Uh, the heritage sites, archaeological wonders, and cultural objects, um, some of which have survived millennia, uh, have disappeared, violently disappeared, um, in a matter of weeks and months. Um, the world first took notice of this in July of 2014, when Daesh obliterated the Judeo-Christian tomb of Jonah, as in Jonah and the whale, and with it, the Sunni mosque of the Prophet Yunus, uh, which existed on the site. Um, that made headlines around the world, prov providing an invaluable source of propaganda uh, and, and a recruitment tool. Um, and of course, after this, so, the, so then Daesh had to top itself. In February of 2015, it posted a video, which I'm sure you all remember, of its black clad black thugs taking these jackhammers to ancient Nineveh. Uh, once the world's largest city, and then to these colossal winged bulls that had guarded it since the 7th century BC. And as these cameras continued to roll, uh, militants took sledgehammers to price the statues in the nearby Mosul Museum uh, before turning their senseless wrath to the fabled cities of Hatra, Khorsabad, and Nimrud. And, and they were just getting started. And an archaeological snuff film, as it's been called in April, which a slick production complete with a dramatic soundtrack and a slow motion special effects. Daesh showcased its attempts to, to wipe Nimrod in particular off the face of the planet. And, and with it, the Old Testament's palaces of Sennacherib and Asher Nazar Pal, which, which disappeared, disappeared into these explosions worthy of Hollywood blockbusters. Um, they next turned their wrath to Palmyra, uh, which in the first centuries after Christ, at the height of the Roman Empire, served as Rome's gateway to the riches of Persia and the young China. Um, even then, even when, again, at the height of the Roman Empire, Palmyra was an ancient city. It had grown up in the first centuries. Um, it had grown up over, sorry, the previous 2,000 years from this remote caravan station to one of the world's most important centers of cultural learning science, and science, but everything that, that Daesh hates, of course. And in this oasis at these crossroads of several civilizations, emperor after emperor, left behind some of the greatest art and architecture humanity has ever known. Um, and today it's agora, it's castle, it's colonnade, sculptures, temples, and theaters, and tombs. Um, yeah, all in the sands on the road to Damascus um, are a source of pride for the people of Syria and whose Muslims, Jews, and Christians have protected it together uh, since the beginning of their modern nation. Of course, until Daesh, after a week-long offensive against the modern town, uh, they stormed Palmyra on May 21st, raising their black flag over the ruins, as you see here. And having survived the ravages of time, um, and centuries of other marauding armies, the world feared that this iconic site would not survive ideological fanaticism, and, and some of it has not, um, including the, the Temple of Baal Shamin and the Temple of Bel, both World Heritage Sites, um, that were, as you see from these pictures here, literally wiped off uh, the earth with damage so severe that it's visible uh, for space. Um, these pictures also surfaced around the same time of Daesh figures uh, destroying uh, so-called idols. Um, so there's more to this story, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but as part of this same campaign. Um, so, so why is this happening? Um, of course, Daesh has pretended their religion, religious reasons for this, that it's a iconoclasm, um, but something more darker and more complicated is happening behind the scenes, um, as we learn from the raid of Abu Sayyaf. So to talk about this for a little bit, on the, on the night of May 15th, 2015, um, U.S. Special Forces Operations, uh, supposedly Delta Force, so I believe it hasn't actually been confirmed, led a mission in eastern Syria to capture 
the senior Dash leader Abu Sayyaf, who was the group's director of its financial operations, um, the so-called emir of oil and gas. And at this time, their trade and natural resources had already been well documented, along with, a, of course, a thriving business and extortion and ransom. But the special forces have recovered proof of something more that. Dash had developed another critical stream of income, ancient art ripped from archaeological ruins and the cradle of civilization. And a treasure trove of documents that were uncovered during this raid exposed uh, this illicit trade in detail. They confirmed earlier warnings from experts, um, including our crew, that Dash's antiquities operations were far more systematic than, than this opportunistic grave robbing, which had been taking place uh, in the region for centuries. Um, quite the contrary, its cultural racketeering was industrial, methodical, and strictly controlled from the highest levels of the organization's leadership, like, like Abu Sayyaf. These, these, papers, um, these papers revealed, again, just a treasure trove of information. Um, they showed that Abu Sayyaf, who did not survive uh, the raid, that he headed Dash's Dewan al Rikaz, that's the Department of Natural Resources. And this office includes an entire antiquities department, itself subdivided by geography and specialization, with these bureaus carved out for administrative uh, administration, exploration, identification of new sites, investigation of known sites, excavation, and the marketing and the sale of antiquities. And I'm sure it goes without saying that by placing the Antiquities Department under the Dewan al Rakaz, um, Dash has clearly indicated that it views cultural heritage as a resource to be exploited like any other. Um, under this system, they ban looting for individual profit. As you can see here, these are translations provided by the State Department. Not to protect sites, but to control the business. See, Dash issues permits to loot and traffic antiquities, subject to a traditional 20% king's tax, a religious levy on spoils of war, which, by the way, has also been used on antiquities uh, by the Taliban. Receipts for such transactions are signed by Sayaf or by other top officials in the Duan were also recovered, and just three months of these receipts indicated total sales worth $1.25 million. So $5 million annual, annualized of, of receipts that were recovered, again, from one raid um, from one villa in the Iron Road of Syria. Moreover, a cache of antiquities was also found in the compound, presumably awaiting sale uh, beyond the group's borders. While most of these were small and easily transported, photos on a computer showed larger items that had likely already been sold. Um, now, interestingly, some of these pieces, um, some of these recovered pieces from the Abu Sayyaf raid came from the Mosul Museum in northern Iraq. Remember the slide I showed earlier? Uh, which shows a scene from February 2015. And then and there, Dash had proclaimed its intention to destroy the museum's collection of idols. Um, and yet, many of these pieces, with their inventory numbers still intact, uh, were found at Sayyaf's uh, compound. So while they were destroying these artifacts on camera as part of their propaganda and their recruitment efforts, behind the scenes they were plundering and trafficking them for profit. So in the months and year that's followed, we've learned more about this trade. And I've, I've even been told um, by colleagues who are working with a network on the ground in Syria that in this picture, for example, the statues weren't being destroyed because they were idols. They were being destroyed because their tra traffickers had not given Dash a cut of the profits. Um, the resulting damage from this, this looting is so visible, is so severe that it is literally visible from space Satellite imagery indicates that more than 3,000 of 15,000 identified archaeological sites have been looted in Syria alone since the war began. And in Daesh occupied areas, 42% of these pillage sites have been heavily plundered, suggesting state sanctioned operations. And this destruction has been corroborated on the ground by numerous civil society activists, um, some of which you were able to 
to send these pictures to our colleagues on the Day After Project. But um, they've individuals like this um, who are documenting this carnage at, at great risk um, to themselves. Now, no one has hard numbers, um, and many investigations remain classified because of the connections to violent extremists. But without doubt, this trade is a growing source of revenue for terrorists in Iraq, Syria, and elsewhere. Um, the Day After Project, uh, again, I, I mentioned before, which is a Syrian group that we work with, reports that these antiquities here were auctioned um, in Raqqa. The asking price was $150,000 each, and we don't know if they sold for that. But we do know that the U.S. government um, has publicly warned that Daesh and has earned several million dollars from antiquities trafficking since 2014, and that stat was uh, about a year old now, so it's gone up significantly since then. And analysts are also warning that this number is going to continue to rise as their other revenue streams are, are cut off. Uh, for example, as oil prices continue to plummet. And even though their territory is shrinking, as I'm sure you've seen in the news, they still have access to priceless antiquities and countless archaeological sites in the region. And, and this has allowed um, them to find an income stream uh, sufficiently secure to make any chief financial officer sleep well at night. I consider that a cylinder seal, which is about the size of a cigarette, can sell for $250,000 and can cross borders undetected by drug-sniffing dogs or metal detectors, and you can see why, why this is a concern, because a little money can go a long way. Um, Dash, in particular, has shown itself capable of doing a lot with very little. Um, you see here the price of what just a million dollar antiquity could could buy um, from the international arms market. And, and also keep in mind that, for example, the estimates for the Paris attacks, that the estimates to pull those off uh, were about $10,000. Um, and so literally with the sale of, of one major piece, um, they would literally be able to to do a lot, a lot of damage. Now I'd like to stress again that this cultural racketeering, it's going hand in hand with cultural cleansing. Um, attacks upon significant Christian sites, uh, along with famous ancient sites like Nineveh, Nimrod, Palmyra, these have gotten the most attention, at least from the Western press, but, and they've been crucial to, to Daesh's propaganda recruiting efforts, but the, they're destroying other sites at a much greater rate. Um, and actually, statistically, the majority of cultural sites targeted have been those sacred to Islam, um, especially the Shiite and Sufi sects. For example, research by the American Schools of Oriental Research, ASOR, which is also based at Boston University, has indicated that in northern Iraq, 39% of sites destroyed have been Shiite, 17% have been Sufi, and 8% have been Sunni. So about, I think, close to 70% of the sites targeted have actually been, again, those sacred to Islam. Only 3% um, are classified as ancient, and those have mostly been for, for propaganda purposes. And the destruction of this Islamic heritage um, illustrates their efforts to rewrite the history of Islam in furtherance of their political agenda, because, of course, there is no greater threat to violent extremists like violent Islamic extremists than the moderate Islam. These attacks on heritage um, are attacks not just on buildings, but against the people of Iraq and Syria, and indeed the world. It's our heritage too. Daesh is seeking to destroy that which matters most to its victims, and once that's done, as, as we've seen through genocides uh, throughout history, the, the next step is to destroy the people themselves. And we see this with the, the brutal murder of Khaled Assad, he was called the father of Palmyra and was the top expert on the site. Um, he was brutally murdered by ISIS. And his murder shows that people are willing to kill to control history, and, and likewise that people are willing to, to die to protect it. And after all, um, if you want to rewrite history, you first have to murder the guardians of history. 
Daesh knows this, and this is something that, again, all genocidal regimes, all mass murderers have known throughout history. We certainly know the Nazis knew it. Um, you see here um, pictures of the destruction of Warsaw. And, uh, for example, when, when this destroyed, uh, when this was destroyed, uh, Himmler said, you know, the city must completely disappear from the surface of the earth and serve only as a transport station. No stone can remain standing. Every building must be raised to its foundation. Um, when it was destroyed in 1944 as an attack against the Polish people and in a failed attempt to, to break their spirit. Um, as discussed earlier, the Khmer Rouge knew this as well. Um, and this, we see similar things happening um, during the, the Balkans crisis. You see here the, the Bridge of Mostar, which stood for 427 years until it was destroyed um, in November 1993 by Croat forces um, during the Croat-Bosniak War. And uh, SEP has been reconstructed, and the rebuilt bridge opened on in July 2004. But this is, you know, showing that this is not just ancient history here. Now, as devastating as this cultural destruction is, the, the destruction of these places that make us who we are, um, like, again, history warn, warns us that when this happens, there's wars to come. Um, but once you erase a people's historic identity, the next step is to erase the people themselves. And again, this is why stopping this devastation of the region's cultural identity and ending the humanitarian crisis really go hand in hand, because those who have no respect for humanity's greatest achievement have no respect for humanity itself. And that, I think, is something that has gotten the international community's attention. And amidst all this, this terrible news, there, there has been action um, at the highest levels. Starting with, um, in February 2015, uh, the United Nations, for one, confirmed uh, this connection between cultural racketeering and terrorist financing and, and a binding and unanimous resolution. Um, the relevant excerpts you see here, the Security Council recognized that Daesh, that Iran Nuclear Front, that Al-Qaeda and other groups associated with them um, were indeed funding themselves through the looting and smuggling of cultural heritage. And, and just this recognition is a huge step that I think um, was, was long overdue. And, and they further warned that these earnings are being used, uh, quote, to support recruitment efforts and strengthen operational capability to organize and carry out terrorist attacks. And this resolution, Resolution 2199, uh, put this cultural racketeering on par uh, is of equal concern as to that with money raised from oil and ransoms and further ordered all member states to take appropriate steps to prevent this illicit trade. Um, now the Security Council is not the only not alone in being concerned. In, in August of last year, the FBI issued a, a very rare alert to the art market and revealed that it was received credible reports um, that artifacts looted by Daesh were reaching the U.S. Um, and cautioned that collectors and dealers who purchased them may be funding weapons and troops. And the Bureau called on the art world's leaders to help them keep these conflict antiquities off the market and also warned that those dealing in such items may be subject to sanctions um, and more seriously prosecution for providing financial support to terrorist organizations. And another unprecedented action of the Wars for Justice Department uh, through the DOJ, their tagline was Stop a Terrorist, Save Lives, um, issued a $5 million reward for information on the trafficking of antiquities along with oil um, by, by Daesh. Um, so this, again, these are all very unprecedented things. Um, that has not really happened before. In addition uh, to the UN and the US, um, I think it's very important to stress that the Middle East and North Africa are also taking a great deal of action. Um, and you can imagine this is a huge concern to, to their governments as well, um, who risk not only losing the region's cultural heritage and a potential economic resource as well, but also Again, just from regional security, the, the trade in these items is in these, these terrorist groups 
in, in May of last year, uh, May 2015, the Arab Republic of Egypt has taken a very strong stance on this issue. The Middle East Institute, based in Washington, and our organization, the Antiquities Coalition, brought together the head of the Arab League, uh, the Director General of UNESCO, Irina Bakova, and ministers from 10 um, key MENA nations. Um, these included Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, uh, Lebanon, Libya, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, and, and the UAE. So both what we call source and market countries. And they were joined by over 20 leading experts uh, from the fields of heritage, law, law enforcement, counterterrorism, and security who, who shared their experiences with the ministers and their delegations in order to help develop solutions to these threats uh, facing the region's heritage. And this was the first time that you had um, officials of this level, again at the ministerial level, in one room together to discuss this issue. And it resulted in the issuance of the, the Cairo Declaration, which was the first communique of its kind, committing these 10 countries to specific actions over the upcoming years. Uh, building on this Cairo conference um, in September of, of last year, the Antiquities Coalition Asia Society, which actually, in their definition of Asia, does include uh, the Middle East, and the Middle East Institute again convened political experts um, and leaders, this time in New York during the United Nations General Assembly meetings. And this included foreign ministers, foreign ministers, not the antiquities ministers, from Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, and Australia, um, as well as ambassadors and senior officials from Cambodia, from Thailand, Italy, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia who joined with diverse leaders of arts institutions, archaeological associations, and experts in terrorism, and in this high-level multi-sector forum, again, you know, seeking to develop solutions to this black market trade and conflict interest that's just continuing um, to, to build the political will needed to tackle it. Encouragingly, just days later, the United Nations also launched a new initiative, which was chaired by the foreign ministers, again, foreign ministers, which we think is hugely important as they have such power to do things, of Jordan and Italy, uh, with strong support from UNESCO, from UNODC, which is the UN Office of Drugs and Crime, and, and Interpol. And this continuing initiative, um, the bulk of which they've had three meetings over the past a year at the UN to continue raising awareness of this is, is aimed to strengthen the political determination of, of UN member states to do what's necessary to shut down this trade. And, and again, just to repeat, all of these initiatives are recognized that the first step is really building political will, that that's critical. Um, and once you have that, then you're able to accomplish some of these other things. Um, but of course, now it's time to turn this political will into action. Um, with the Asia Society and the Middle East Institute, we convened the Cultural Under Threat Task Force last year to help develop recommendations um, that will help to counter these threats. And with this working group, we brought together leaders from the heritage communities, from law enforcement, legal, military, and security. Um, a really diverse group of experts um, together to develop a comprehensive and holistic range of recommendations. Um, we ended up with 31, 31 different steps that could be taken by the art market, um, but most importantly by the United States. This is really geared toward the U.S., what the U.S. can do both acting alone um, and also as a member of the international community and included steps for, for the White House, uh, for the Obama administration, for Congress, for the armed forces. Um, then also, again, what we could be pushing for at the UN level and what we could push the art market to do. Um, and we've, we've seen some action on this. Again, we have 31 recommendations in this report. Um, Several have been achieved already, most importantly, uh, the passage of the Preser Protect and Preserve International Cultural Property Act, uh, which is Senate Bill 1887, uh, House Bill 1493, which placed emergency protection um, through import restrictions on Syrian cultural property coming into the U.S., which added to similar restrictions that we already have in place, thankfully, for Iraq. And 
It created the position of the U.S. coordinator for international property protection within the State Department and has mandated annual reporting on what the U.S. government um, has done. And so this has been a huge, huge step to, to cut off um, our market to conflict antiquities um, in Syria while not affecting um, so-called legitimate trade um, in these pieces. Um, two days later, again, a lot of this has been happening, was happening very quickly. Um, Niger surrendered Ahmad al Mahdi al Faki to the International Criminal Court in The Hague uh, for severe violations of international law committed in Mali, um, specifically the, the targeted and intentional destruction of, of these ancient signs in an ancient mosque. And this was the first ICC case um, brought for human rights abuses during the Malian Civil War. It was also the first case of Islamic fundamentalist. Um, it was the first case in which it, there was a guilty plea, and it was the first case uh, bought for cultural property crimes. So there was a lot of first in these cases. Um, in this case, and because Almadi uh, did plead guilty, it was able to uh, to move very quickly, um, and also provided you know a bright spot, and I think a, a spot of hope certainly for for those in Iraq right now that. Daesh may be one day held accountable in a court of law for the destruction of the religious building there. Um, so this trial has since been resolved and hopefully will just be the first of many. Uh, continuing these efforts in Amman this summer, um, Juan Jordan and the second annual Middle Eastern Summit, so this followed up on the, the Cairo Conference and Declaration, was hosted by the Kingdom of Jordan on Jul uh, September 8th of this year. and. With this, um, it was able to continue the work started in Cairo and, more importantly, to launch a regional task force, uh, the Middle Eastern North African Task Force Against Cultural Racketeering, which is the first such group of its kind made up of a representative from each country. Seventeen countries um, attended this meeting and participated in the task force. So this is nearly double the number of countries um, that attended the, the Cairo conference. And so this task force has met, and we've actually just had uh, next three calls with Jordan this week to get the ball rolling on its, very, its various initiatives. They've identified five areas of priority that they want to target in the next year, uh, including capacity building for law and law enforcement, improving information sharing, pursuing bilateral agreements both with the United States but also regional agreements to help combat this trade and in, put in place import restrictions, um, heritage jobs initiatives in order to allow these local communities to profit from the preservation of these sites instead of their destruction, and also a campaign to raise awareness both in source and market countries of, of the harm caused by the illicit trade. So this was just a very recent development again in September. Um, and work has already begun to, to carry forward uh, with these goals from, from this task force. So we think, again, this is, in closing, I would just like to stress again why these efforts by, by Jordan, by the International Criminal Court, and by Congress and others are, are so important. Um, Daesh was not the first to traffic in blood antiquities. It won't be the last. Uh, art and antiquities have been stolen and trafficked by many around the world, from organized criminals to drug cartels to mafia syndicates to the Nazis, the Kangaroos, Al Qaeda, the Taliban, and the list goes on. And if we were to defeat Daesh today, and again, thankfully, they are losing ground, but another group will take its place tomorrow because so long as there's a market for conflict antiquities, Criminals, armed insurgents, and yes, violent extremist organizations will find a supply. This is a continuing global crisis and requires continuing global action. And the cost of inaction are, are just too great, as we see from Cambodia's story and the parallels between them that emerge. From the misuse of heritage to gain legitimacy for the purpose for a completely illegitimate cause, to the destruction of heritage as a weapon of war, and to the trafficking at the highest levels um, of the regime. Here you see uh, General Pa Mok, who was brother number four in the Khmer Rouge when he was captured in the mid-2000s, 
how the Canadian government recovered just one masterpieces, some of which you see here, which were awaiting shipment over the border in Thailand. Um, not so unlike what happened with the raid of Abu Sayyaf. And so Cambodia's story is very much a warning for us that the raising of temples, of mosques, and churches that's followed by the murder of people. In Cambodia's case, it was the death of two million people, like a quarter of the population. Uh, the world failed Cambodia. Uh, we did. Um, and our hope is that we won't fail current areas of crisis, that we can confront these crises head on while putting in place measures to prevent future ones. Finally, um, despite the, this crisis at hand, I would like to end with a message of hope that again, while today the global hotspot is Iraq and Syria, four decades ago it was Indochina, including Cambodia, and Cambodia has suffered immensely. I mean, one of the tragedies of, of the 20th century, but it was able to survive this um, and come back stronger than ever uh, with its culture certainly battered but not broken. And Today, it's bringing home its stolen treasures and it's welcoming millions of people. It's something that would have been impossible just a decade or two ago. And I think we all look forward to the day and in our lifetime when we can say the same about Iraq and Syria. And that, of course, is the goal that we are all working for today. Um, so that's, that's the, the bulk of my presentation right now, but I'm very happy to answer questions. And again, um, thank you for all joining us on today when I know there are a lot of distractions in the news. It's much appreciated. Thank you so much, Tess. Um, everyone, you can submit your questions through the Q&A box that you see below the slide. And we do already have one question from Mark. Tess, can you talk about the nature of the negotiations to recover these items? In particular, what is given in return? For the items in question, and who is typically involved in the negotiation? Oh, great question. Um, as with so many things, this is something that that varies very much from case to case. Um, and certainly, different countries have different approaches. Um, in Cambodia's case, um, this was done in large part with the assistance of the U.S. Department of Justice, um, just because. As the evidence was so strong uh, that, again, these pieces were stolen from the country, and not only stolen from the country, but almost certainly um, profited the, the Camer Rouge at this point. Um, so the U.S. Attorney's Office from the Southern District of New York was actively involved in this effort, but subsequent ones um, have been carried out, again, by the, the their Secretary of State, His Excellency Chan um, which I think is one reason they have been so successful that they have someone who is a diplomat, who is a trained negotiator, and who has a very high respectful position in the government. It, it shows the importance that they've placed on these efforts. Um, and I think, again, it's also led to a lot of a lot of the success because he recognizes that in many ways this is you know, a political issue, it's a foreign policy issue, it's not necessarily an issue of preservation. Um, the positive thing coming out of this is that, again, most of these cases uh, were handled without involving the courts. Um, and to the institution's credit, and especially, um, I would say, to the credit of the Metropolitan Museum of Art and to Christie's Auction House, um, they really immediately went above and beyond to try to do the right thing. Um, and I, I like to think that both of these also institutions have benefited uh, from that. Um, you know, after sending these statues back, um, Cambodia has made a number of loans uh, to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and they've also um, done a lot of um, exchange with contemporary Cambodian art, which is actually becoming quite popular on the international market. We've had some major shows of Cambodia's top contemporary artists, and so Full credit is due to these institutions for, for recognizing Cambodia's request, not for not treating it as an obstacle, but treating it as an opportunity to build a stronger relationship and to lead to increased exchange. Um, and that indeed has happened. Uh, and actually, Cambodia has also sent other pieces uh, back to, to Cleveland, 
um, and sent one to, to France recently to make a fragment there they had whole. Um, so I, at least the Cambodian government, I think, is very committed. They, they want people in the United States and elsewhere to see Cambodian art. They're very honored that people want to um, and appreciate it. And it certainly serves as a good ambassador. They just want this done in a responsible way um, that, again, does not profit from Cambodia's long conflict. Thank you. So in addition to participating in webinars like this one, how can um, those of us listening continue to stay educated about this topic or just learn more? What's a good resource? And, you know, is there anything that we can do? Oh, well, I encourage you to, I mean, the press has been doing actually a really great job of, of covering this topic recently. Um, there's been a lot of fantastic coverage in the New York Times, but even outlets like BuzzFeed um, have been have been dedicating a lot to this. I, I really encourage everyone, if you're interested in learning more, to visit our website. It's the antiquitiescoalition.org. Um, we have a very active social media account. We have one in both English and Arabic. Um, and uh, the mailing list as well, which I encourage you to sign up for, because there are a lot of things happening in this field right now. I've been working in this area for 12 years, um, and it's been something to see the attention that is now being paid to this when you have people like Francois Hollande and John Kerry and uh, even Pope Francis who, who are commenting on this and following this issue. It's, it's again a real opportunity to achieve some policy changes. But first I would say uh, to keep informed um, there's a lot of you, know, you can follow us and also encourage you to check out the American School of Oriental Research, uh, sorry, Research which is also at BU that's ASOR um, who are doing a lot of interest, um, amazing research on this, um, but also just to, to start you know, asking questions of things and, and paying attention to this issue. There's been several bills in Congress lately on this um, that have certainly benefited from the support of the public. But for those of you who are involved in the arts or who are on the boards of museums, um, just to make sure that these are responsible practices. Um, and of course, um, we do discourage the purchase of maintenance of antiquities, which has become easier than ever thanks to eBay, um, for a number of reasons. For one, a lot of them might be fake, but um, in fact, a lot of them are fake. But if, if you're not purchasing a fake, you're almost certainly purchasing something that was stolen. And again, there is a concern today that um, you could be purchasing something that could have, have benefited some of these terrorist groups. Um, so just to, to act responsibly, most museums uh, follow a code that if you purchase an antiquity, it should have been out of the country um, by 1970. Um, so that's not the legal standard, but it's increasingly viewed as the ethical standard. Wow. OK, thank you so much. Um, we're just about out of time. Um, so I want to, again, thank you, Tess, for your presentation and thank everyone who took time out of this day to participate, um, to listen in. And I want to invite you all to continue to participate in our webinars. Um, in fact, we have one on November 17th. It's a career webinar called How to Flip Resistant Colleagues into Rabid Supporters. Um, so please join us for that if you, if you are available. Thank you once again. I hope all of you have a great day. Thank you.